1946, these two men created the world's first computer company. Five years later, they were broke, victims of a political witch hunt. Apparently, the president and I now agree on the necessity of getting rid of communists. And muscled out by a company that no one could beat. The untold story of the computer industry's rocky beginnings is finally revealed on Inventing the Future. Tonight, on the machine that changed the world. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. technological triumph. It gave birth to radar, financed the development of rockets, and created the atomic bomb. Among these spectacular achievements was a quieter project one that was shrouded in secrecy at the University of Pennsylvania. Behind the walls of this building, a small team of scientists and engineers created a machine designed specifically for war, but destined in the coming years to touch the lives of everyone. That machine was the computer. In 1946, this was the only working electronic computer in the entire world few people had heard of it. Fewer still regarded it as anything special. Yet in less than two decades, computers would number in the thousands. Rooms full of clerks would be replaced by these lightning-fast machines. In a few short years, computers would change forever the way the world did business, and in so doing, become one of the largest and most powerful industries on Earth. In 1946, American moviegoers caught their first glimpse of this strange new machine. Are people becoming obsolete? A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first... It was named ENIAC, for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows, someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. No one really believed the computer would have much to do with income taxes or any other aspect of everyday life. ENIAC had been created for one purpose, to calculate ballistic tables for the huge guns of World War II. Even after the war, most people thought this giant brain would remain isolated in a scientific laboratory, crunching numbers for the U.S. Army. Few people could imagine a market for more than a half dozen computers in the entire world. People thought that the market for the machines was just for a few, or a few dozen at most, and the market would saturate, and then who would want any more? It's like you were trying to make a business of making atom smashers. Uh, maybe you could make a little money on one or two, but uh, then what would you do for an encore? 
But these two men thought differently. The creators of ENIAC, J. Presper Eckert and John Mockley, believed the computer would command a greater destiny, serving not only science, but business as well. When Eckert and Mockley proposed to make a commercial venture out of building and selling electronic computers, a lot of people were very skeptical. And they raised a number of very interesting objections. The first one was that the machine was made out of large numbers of vacuum tubes. And these tubes were prone to burning out. In fact, uh, if you could keep one of these uh, machines like the ENIAC running for a few hours before a vacuum tube burned out, you considered that great. ENIAC, with its 18,000 vacuum tubes, was the size of a small house. And in today's money, it cost $3 million to build. This alone was enough for people to believe that computers were impractical as a commercial product. But there was another, more pressing reason. ENIAC was a very difficult machine to use. You almost required an understanding of very advanced mathematics or logic to even get the computer to add two numbers together. And people felt that such a talent was so rare in the world that it didn't matter if you could mass produce the computers, you would never find enough people who had that skill to make them useful. But the inventors of ENIAC, reluctant to abandon their dream of starting a computer company, set out to find financial backers. Generally speaking, when we talk to businessmen and banks, financial institutions at that time, they took a very dim view of all of this and, and they really didn't uh, have enough insight to see into the future far enough to believe anything like this could work. My father signed a note at the bank for $25,000, which helped us get started until we could get going. With that modest sum in hand, Presper Eckert and John Mockley launched the world's first commercial computer company. This small Philadelphia firm constituted the entire U.S. computer industry in 1946. The next order of business for the two entrepreneurs was to find a customer for their product. But who besides the United States Army would want such a machine? Eckert and Mockley knew the answer to that question lay in the business community. Since the turn of the century, business relied on punched card tabulating machines for their record keeping and accounting needs. One installation contained many single purpose machines punch machines to punch data onto cards. Sorters to sort those cards into alphabetic or numerical order. Tabulators to perform simple addition. And printers to print the results. Armies of clerks spent their days performing the same operations shuffling punched cards from machine to machine. It was very tedious work. Whenever you see tedium or repetitiveness of any kind, that's a candidate for computation. With that in mind, Eckert and Mockley knew just where to go to sell their first computer, the United States Census Bureau. By the 1940s, the Census Bureau employed thousands of clerks and tabulating machines to process population data. They were drowning in punched cards with enough paper files to fill a football field. And time was running out. They had a census coming up in a few years, and the time it took to process the census was getting longer and longer. And, it was, and they are mandated by Congress to get the census done in a certain length of time because elections are based upon it. And they were fearful that in the following election they wouldn't get done in time without something better than they had. Over lunch at the Census Bureau, Eckert and Mockley described their new machine to Morris Hansen and his colleagues. We thought it was magic. <laughs> we didn't believe it was really feasible to begin with. As we talked more and more with them, we came to believe that they knew what they were talking about and that they had already demonstrated uh, some important aspects of it in ENIAC. With this order from the Census Bureau, the computer industry had finally begun. This footage, taken with John Mockley's home camera, 
provides us with a glimpse of the company's beginnings. They named their computer UNIVAC, or Universal Automatic Computer. Within a few months, Eckert and Mockley realized they had vastly underestimated the time and money their pioneering work would require. The company soon fell badly behind schedule and seriously in debt. It was a pattern the two inventors would repeat time and time again. They were terrific engineers and designers. They were not terrific business people. They had problems and uh, they gave us estimates and unfortunately we Unfortunately for them, in a sense, we made a contract with them, a fixed-price contract to produce a Univac, which ties us down legally. And uh, that wasn't enough money for them to produce a Univac, nor was the time schedule enough. Uh, these are not criticisms. When you're doing developmental work like this, this is what uh, you expect to run into. But they hadn't anticipated enough of this kind of a problem. Alone in their field, Eckert and Mockley were inventing the future and there were many unknowns. They spent considerable resources developing special components like magnetic tape and mercury tanks, both to store data, the electronic equivalent of boxes of paper files. Charting this new territory took its toll on the company. After a year in business, the Eckerd Mockley Computer Company was struggling to stay alive. Once again, they tried to obtain loans or attract investors but no one, it seemed, would take a chance on these two pioneers or their unproven technology. And time was not on their side. Meanwhile, 3,500 miles away in London, Britain's computer industry was also just beginning. This would turn out to be one of the most unusual episodes in computer history. This is the J. Lyons Company, a wholesale food business that distributed tea, pastries, and other food items throughout the United Kingdom. J. Lyons produced more than 40,000 products and employed more than 30,000 people. It may seem strange that a company which produced tea and pastries would start Britain's commercial computer industry, yet that's just what happened. You had in the senior management of the office in Lyons some extremely far-sighted people with um, a considerable mathematical background. So it wasn't any surprise, really, that when they heard about these giant brains in the British newspapers, they thought to themselves, this is something we must investigate. After the war, the Lyons Company was desperate for a way to streamline its growing operation particularly such costly and tedious clerical tasks as inventory control, payroll, and invoicing. What Lyons needed was a computer, but in 1947 there was no computer to buy in London. So this innovative company decided to build their own. To learn how, they made a deal with Cambridge University, whose own work on a computer called EDSAC was well underway. In 1951, three years after they made the deal with Cambridge, the Lyons Company completed its computer. They called it the Lyons Electronic Office, appropriately nicknamed Leo. Leo was soon put to work processing the Lyons Company payroll, completing in less than seven hours what had previously taken 200 clerks almost a week to do. It wasn't long before other British firms heard about Leo and asked Lyons to build them one. Inspired by this demand, in 1954, the Lyons Company, purveyors of tea and pastries, added a new product line, computers. Back in America, Eckert and Mockley's path had not gone as smoothly. By 1948, they had been in business two years and were still far behind schedule. While Presper Eckert worked feverishly on the Census Bureau's Univac, John Mockley searched for more customers to relieve their financial crisis. Most companies he approached showed little more than a passing interest in computers. But there were exceptions. 
the Prudential Insurance Company had an urgent need for high-speed computing. Hundreds of new accountants would have been needed to comply with a new law requiring them to recalculate insurance rates. To help with this massive job, Prudential ordered a Univac in 1948. There were other contracts under negotiation, important Defense Department contracts that could have put the eckert mockley Company on the road to solvency. But on top of everything else, political events would get in the way. Apparently the President and I now agree on the necessity of getting rid of communists. We apparently do. McCarthyism cast its shadow over the eckert mockley Company. The men who had built ENIAC with top secret security clearance during World War II were now under suspicion of having communist ties. Those were the days of McCarthyism in Washington. And their idea was to pull your security clearance and not even tell you why. So contracts you had lined up, customers you had lined up who were going to invest money in your projects just quietly pulled out and wouldn't tell you why. But this is why. In the early 1940s, John Mockley came to the attention of the FBI. He had attended a meeting of a scientific organization that, unknown to him, had a communist affiliation. This single event prevented him from obtaining security clearances needed to work on defense projects. It would take nearly a decade for John Mockley to clear his name, and he carried the resentment with him until his death in 1980. With the loss of those defense contracts, the eckert mockley Company sank deeper into debt, putting the very future of the fledgling American computer industry in jeopardy. Then in 1948, help came from a most unlikely source. Riders up. American Totalizator Company, makers of the mechanical equipment that calculated odds and displayed payoffs at racetracks, was headed by Harry Strauss. A man of vision, Strauss foresaw the day when computers might replace his totalizator equipment. To hedge his bets, Strauss purchased a 40% interest in Eckert Mockley, injecting desperately needed funds into the company. For the next year, the eckert mockley Computer Company underwent rapid expansion, increasing staff from 40 to 134 employees. But this prosperity would be short-lived. Eckert and Mockley's last best hope vanished when Harry Strauss died in a plane crash in October 1949. One month later, Strauss's partners notified Eckert and Mockley they wanted out of the computer business and they just wanted to get out of something which they regarded as a financial loss. They also didn't think it was going to work. They didn't have any faith in it as Mr. Strauss did. And so they encouraged us to get somebody else to buy the idea out as soon as possible. All was lost for the two inventors who had had such high hopes only four years earlier. It was now clear the American computer industry, if there was to be one at all, would not be led by the eckert Mockley Company. On February 1st, 1950, Presper Eckert and John Mockley sold their firm to Remington Rand, by then one of the largest business machine companies in the world. Remington Rand sold a variety of products, including typewriters, filing cabinets, and punched card tabulating machines. But to the general public, they were best known for their electric shavers. James Rand, president of Remington Rand, liked to speculate in new ventures. He also wanted to gain a foothold in this new field of electronics. The challenge now fell to Remington Rand to prove that computers could be sold commercially. Under Remington Rand's label, the first Univac was finally installed at the U.S. Census Bureau, almost a year late and considerably over budget. The delivery of the first commercially built computer only rated a back page story, little noticed by the general public. But within a year, the name Univac would be on the lips of millions of Americans, thanks to a brilliant public relations move by Remington Rand. 
Good evening, everyone. This is Walter Cronkite speaking to you from CBS Television Election Headquarters here in New York City. The big election night, 1952. The On this night, UNIVAC was catapulted from obscurity into national recognition with its television debut. Let's turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain UNIVAC and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is the face of a UNIVAC. A UNIVAC is a fabulous electronic machine which we have borrowed to help us uh, predict this election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. UNIVAC is going to try to predict the winner for us just as early as we can possibly get the returns in. Division. For the first time, a computer was asked to predict the outcome of an election. But things didn't go exactly as planned. The theory of this. This is not a joke or a trick. It's an experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know. We hope it'll work. At, any At 8 o'clock, Collingwood asked UNIVAC to type out its prediction. Can you say something, UNIVAC? Can you tell us uh, what your prediction is now on the basis of the returns that we've had so far? Have you got a prediction for us, UNIVAC? I don't know. I think that UNIVAC is probably an honest machine, a good deal more honest than a lot of commentators who are working, and he doesn't think he's got a, enough to tell us anything about yet. But we'll be back with him later. What Collingwood didn't know was that UNIVAC did have something to say, and this was it. Just before CBS went on the air, UNIVAC predicted Eisenhower would beat Stevenson by a landslide. The problem was, no one believed it. The machine turned out this answer that they didn't believe. The polls were telling them that it was going to be about a 50-50 election, and we were telling them it's a landslide with only 5% of the vote. And they couldn't believe that you could predict the thing as accurately as we did, which was within a few percent, with only 5% of the vote. So everybody was thrown into total confusion. Uh, the Republic. Excuse me. The McCarthy. Uh, but the confusion would not last long. At the moment. <laughs> Votes were now pouring in for Eisenhower. Even before all the polls closed, it was clear that UNIVAC had been right all along. General Eisenhower was winning by the largest landslide in the nation's history. After midnight, CBS confessed to the public what had happened. As more votes came in, the odds came back, and it was obviously evident that we should have had nerve enough to believe the machine in the first place. It was right. We were wrong. Next year, we'll believe it. The next day, the headlines said it all. The whole world took notice of UNIVAC. It's not like one of these machines where you push a button and it just does what you want it to do. I'm not a robot, I'm people. I quit. It wasn't long before UNIVAC began appearing in the movies. <laughs> Even in cartoons. While UNIVAC captured the attention of Hollywood, it was also catching the eye of its intended customers. By the end of 1953, there were three Univacs installed and orders for nine more. And there seemed to be no competition in sight. Not even from Remington Rand's closest rival. Today, the name IBM is synonymous with computers. But in the 1940s, the company showed little interest in these new machines. IBM seemed content to stay with the punched card tabulating equipment that it had pioneered at the turn of the century. And since that time, IBM had placed tabulating machines in every conceivable business environment, from small wholesale firms to huge data processing centers. For half a century, IBM had grown rich on a technology that would soon be rendered obsolete by electronic computers. Yet IBM did not recognize it. The president of IBM, Thomas Watson Sr., was not unaware of computers. He had even built this monstrosity called the SSEC. It was a hybrid machine, part electronic, part electromechanical. 
Completed in 1948, Watson dedicated the SSEC to scientific research, thus ending his foray into computers. Like most people at the time, he thought computers were purely scientific machines. He did not believe they posed any threat to his beloved tabulating equipment. But when the Census Bureau, an organization that used hundreds of tabulators, ordered a UNIVAC, one IBM vice president became alarmed, Tom Watson, Jr. I'll never forget how I felt about the eckert Monkley contract in the Census Bureau. I felt a sense of great panic and uh, went back to Washington, uh, to New York City from Washington and uh, had a late night conference saying, look, we do, this is the beginning of the end for the IBM company unless we recognize it and do something about it. Tom Watson Jr. knew that IBM could lose everything if the company didn't get into the computer business. But nothing was done at IBM without his father's approval. He would not listen to those of us in IBM who were advancing those thoughts. However, he would listen to his son. Uh, he would oppose his son. When he uh, opposed or disagreed with uh, others in IBM management than his son, their jobs were in jeopardy. Uh, therefore, he created a culture of yes men around him. His son was not a yes man. His son fought his father, contested his father's views, and of course, being the son, he survived. But when I'd say, well, look, Dad, if we don't take this business, somebody else will take it for us because the, we're now being pushed by the market. We're market-driven. We're not driving the market. The market is driving us. We ought to try to get ahead of it. Some stormy sessions getting there, but at the end of the road, he was agreeable. IBM finally took its first steps into the computer age with a production line of 20 scientific computers. The year was 1951 five years after Eckert and Mockley had started their UNIVAC. That delay would come to haunt Tom Watson, Jr. For while IBM was building its scientific computer, UNIVAC was slowly stealing away IBM's commercial customers. This so infuriated the younger Watson that he vowed to focus all his energy beating UNIVAC. And this time, he was free to lead the charge. After 40 years at the helm, Thomas Watson Sr. stepped aside, putting his son Tom in charge of the company. IBM's fate was now in Tom Watson Jr.'s hands. Watson introduced one of IBM's first business computers in 1953. At first glance, it was no match for UNIVAC. The IBM 650 was slow and inefficient, but it did have one big advantage. IBM Salesforce, the company's greatest asset and the envy of IBM's competitors. I think we made such rapid progress when initially some of those companies had better technology than we had, and certainly a better knowledge of how to use that technology. We were able to zip right by them with that sales and service force. IBM Salesforce was the powerful legacy of Thomas Watson, Sr. His approach to sales was ferocious, and his understanding of salesmen superb. He rewarded them with high commissions, pushed them with quotas, inspired them with speeches, educated them in classrooms, and punished them if they didn't toe the line. Well, he expected uh, at least the moon and perhaps the sun from his salesman. He wanted a, a good sales job, and he wanted a lot of orders because we grew with orders, and he also used to say, look, uh, the salesman who is the man who makes things happen in the United States. Nothing happens until something is sold. Then it's manufactured, it's delivered, it's used, but nothing happens. And so the salesman, in his mind, was a sort of a, an American hero, and perhaps very high on the list of American heroes. These heroes of IBM soon convinced hundreds of ordinary businessmen to buy the 650 computer. Orders started pouring in. It became known as the Model T of the computing industry, the first truly mass-produced computer. 
Within a year, IBM sold almost a thousand. The 650, for one thing, was relatively inexpensive. Usable models were no more than a quarter of a million dollars, some of them even less. And perhaps more importantly, the 650 fit directly into existing punch card installations. It used punch card readers and punches and printers that the customer already had and was familiar with. That was the genius of the IBM 650. Although tabulating equipment made the machine run much slower, it was easier for customers to use. Univac, on the other hand, required its customers to give up the old equipment and transfer punched card data onto magnetic tape. That was a more efficient way to process information, but customers were more comfortable with the old way. In 1956, IBM soared past Remington Rand as the largest computer company in the world. Tom Watson, Jr. had won in his battle for survival. The punch card business was most of IBM's business, so if they didn't carry on beyond this, they were done. Whereas Remington Rand, the punch card business, and our business was only like 10% of it or something. They had the typewriters and all this other stuff, and razors and everything else that were doing well at that time, so that there wasn't the same incentive to push forward with us as there was in IBM either. And I've always felt that if Remington Rand had just concentrated on that company that they bought, they could have swept the field because they had three uh, commercial machines installed while we had none. As the 1950s came to a close, IBM had captured more than three quarters of the U.S. computer market. The rest was shared by Remington Rand and a half dozen other companies. With almost 10,000 computers in operation in the United States, it was now clear, even to the early skeptics, that computers could be a useful and reliable business tool. But the advertisements failed to mention one important thing. In the late 1950s, the computer manufacturers' advertisements and proposals were rosy. And we who were making those promises turned out to be liars. We didn't know we were, but we were. The problem was software, software development. Writing software, the programs that tell the computer what to do, turned out to cost two, three, even four times the price of the machine itself. In fact, this problem of software development grew so severe that it really threatened the further growth of the computer industry. Computers costing thousands of dollars a month would sit idle while programmers struggled with the arcane language that computers understand. We BPX to 10D, AOR 10... Well, this AOR gets us into a BSN 11. Don't we want a BSN 12 instead? Unfortunately, computers cannot execute programs written in English. They require a special language of their own. The computer only understands the language of binary, and it's really a code, not a language. Binary simply means zeros and ones, analogous to an electric light switch, which is either on or off. The zeros and ones of binary code make it perfectly suited to computers that operate with thousands of electrical switches. In binary, the number one represents a switch that is turned on, and the number zero represents a switch that is turned off. But what works well for computers does not work well for human beings. If one simply looks at an example of what the binary code would have to be for 5 times 7 plus 3, one can see that it's incredibly difficult to write that kind of thing accurately. In the first place, it's tedious to write it, and in the second place, it's almost impossible to do it correctly. Impossible because most programs were thousands of lines long, millions of zeros and ones. Programmers labored long and tedious hours trying to create programs, often to find they just didn't work. Then they spent even more tedious hours trying to find their errors. As had been predicted, this was not a job that attracted many people. The shortage of programmers could, in the worst case, have caused the growth of the computer industry to come to a dead halt because there were so few 
programmers. Without programmers, you don't have programs, that is to say, software, and without software, the computer is useless. You might just as well have an automobile without a driver. It doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there. It soon became clear the software crisis could only be solved by making programming easier to do, to create higher-level languages, closer to human language. The first high-level language that became significantly used was Fortran. It was a language that could be used by scientists and mathematicians and was much easier to program in because it allowed them to write equations in the way they were used to. Fortran was great for scientists and mathematicians, but it was almost no use to business users who needed their own language, one that could handle letters as well as numbers and could process files of data. For that, you needed a different kind of language, and that led to the development of COBOL, which stands for Common Business-Oriented Language. COBOL was very English-oriented. That is to say, you wrote the programs in a language which was certainly not identical to English, but at least looked like English when you read it and wrote it. COBOL was terrific for programmers, easy to use, and to find errors. And with the help of another piece of software called a compiler, the COBOL program is automatically translated back to the binary code that the computer understands. Higher level languages like COBOL ushered in an endless variety of new uses for computers, even some unconventional ones. Operating around the clock, this communication center receives and processes all incoming requests for police service. In Kansas City, Missouri, the American Hereford Association dedicated a new electronic computer. On hand to push the starting switch, America's grand champion Hereford Bull, HR Silver Image 70. This hoof switch started a new IBM 1401 computer that will keep track of all registered Herefords. Silver Image thus became the first animal ever to trace his own ancestry and appeared quite interested in the results. But most computers were found in administrative offices, where those armies of clerks were beginning to disappear, replaced by a single computer. Computers also started showing up in factories, controlling machines and processes that once required hundreds of human hands. A new word was coined to describe what was happening, automation. Automation is a young, new word, heavy with promise and with problems. As a matter of fact, several people have suggested to us that it's a little too heavy for a Sunday afternoon in June. Could be. We shall see. Automation became the burning issue of the time. Millions of workers wondered when they would be replaced by one of these giant brains. Television documentaries explored both sides of the issue. My four children go hungry because of automation, or what will I have to do? What do I propose to do if they do go hungry? What chance uh, or choice is left to me but to turn to crime because of automation? And it's true that this plan will cause a layoff of some of our loyal workers. However, it's a necessity to do it to be competitive in today's industry. Buddy, I thought you'd never get back. Do Hollywood also reflected the growing fear of computers in the workplace. No. Do you know what he's doing here? What? He's trying to replace us all with a mechanical brain. He's under special assignment to his eye to see if Emmerich can be adapted to this department. That means the end of us all. Peg, Peg, calm down. No machine can do our job. Oh, that's what they said in payroll. Movies like Desk Set revealed the conflicting emotions computers stirred up in society. While many people viewed them with fear and disdain, others thought they represented progress, the future, a relief from tedious tasks. Good girl, big girl. But perhaps the staunchest advocates for computers were the computer manufacturers. Tom Watson, Jr. was often called upon to defend his machines against an onslaught of bad publicity. A lot of people call these machines giant brains, and whenever I hear, hear the term, it makes me shudder. Because they are giant, giant tools, they're certainly not giant brains. And if you have good tools, you're upgrading man, not downgrading him. 
That was a common argument, that computers replaced jobs nobody wanted. Certainly it was true at the Bank of America, which employed 2,500 bookkeepers just to process personal checking accounts. Every day they sorted and recorded more than nine million checks. It was an exceptionally tedious job for humans, but the perfect job for a computer. In 1961, the Bank of America replaced its entire staff of bookkeepers with a computer system named Irma. This is Los Angeles, and I'm Ronald Reagan. May I hear, please, from George? In one of his lesser-known roles, Ronald Reagan was the commercial spokesman for General Electric, Irma's manufacturer. The Bank of America has called this new system Electronic Recording Method of Accounting, or by the more familiar and friendlier term, Irma. A competent, experienced bookkeeper using conventional mechanical equipment is expected to do the sorting and posting for about 250 accounts an hour. Irma can sort and post 550 accounts a minute. Magnetic ink characters were the key to the Irma system. Using those numbers, the checks were sorted at the rate of 750 a minute, and the account information was kept on reels of magnetic tape. Irma was more than 100 times faster than the best human bookkeeper, and virtually error-free. Now, we think that Irma displaced thousands of bookkeepers. Well, we created other jobs within the bank because of Irma. I mean, somebody had to handle all the reports coming back from the Irma centers. Somebody had to prepare the work going to the Irma centers. There were other jobs that were created that weren't quite as boring and tedious as being a bookkeeper. Computers like Irma did change the nature of people's work, and some jobs were eliminated. But these were prosperous times in America. The fear of computers replacing human workers would slowly subside as employment continued to rise. One industry that was experiencing unprecedented growth during the 1950s was the vacuum tube business. Computers gobbled up vacuum tubes as fast as the manufacturers could turn them out. This Air Force computer alone used 55,000 vacuum tubes. And tubes were at the heart of every radio. An electronics newest marvel, television. But the vacuum tube boom was about to come to an abrupt end thanks to a tiny electronic component that some have called the most important invention of the 20th century, the transistor. To most people, the transistor meant small portable radios. But this tiny component was beginning to change the entire field of electronics, thanks to its inventors, Walter Bratton, John Bardeen, and William Shockley. In 1956, just eight years after their groundbreaking work, Bratton, Bardeen, and Shockley received the Nobel Prize. The transistor was much, much smaller than vac a vacuum tube, for example, perhaps uh, a 50th the size. It, it weighed about 100 times less than a vacuum tube. It gave off no heat. Uh, it required a fraction of the electrical power that a vacuum tube needed. What that meant for engineers designing computers is that with transistors, they could now think in terms of designing computers that were much, much more complex and powerful than anybody would have dreamed of designing using vacuum tube technology. But as soon as they did that, you see, they ran into this problem of how do you wire them all together? You had this incredible tangle of wiring. Transistors enabled engineers to design fantastically powerful computers, but they were only dreams on a piece of paper. Such computers could never be built simply because so many components could not be wired together. This wiring nightmare became known as the tyranny of numbers, and until it was solved, all progress was blocked. The tyranny of numbers soon became the most important problem in the field of electronics. Every engineer wanted to solve it. 
finally, two engineers independently came up with a solution to this problem. The first was Jack Kilby, an engineer at Texas Instruments in Texas. The second was Robert Noyce, a Fairchild in California. At Fairchild Semiconductor, Robert Noyce worked out the first manufacturable IC, or integrated circuit. And this is what it looked like. Essentially, it is just one piece of silicon. The cone-shaped structures are transistors that were made by chemically altering small sections of the piece of silicon. Other areas of the silicon were altered to create other electronic components. Then to wire everything together, a layer of metal was evaporated on top of the structure. With the invention of the integrated circuit, the tyranny of numbers, the tedious hand wiring of electronic components had been solved because the wiring was now part of the manufacturing process. As an added bonus, the circuitry of a whole board could now be reduced to the size of a fingernail. Both Texas Instruments and Fairchild announced the integrated circuit in 1959. But surprisingly, electronics firms were not interested in buying this new marvel. For some, the integrated circuit was just too radical a change. But for most, it was just too expensive. For two years, ICs lay virtually unused by the electronics establishment. Then, almost overnight, world events changed the future of the integrated circuit. This is BBC Home Service. Here is the news. Moscow is waiting to give a hero's welcome to the world's first spaceman, Major Gagarin of the Soviet Air Force. Major Gagarin In 1961, the orbital flight of cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin stunned the world. In the midst of the Cold War, this Soviet success raised the specter of Russian domination in space. Facing sharp criticism at home and embarrassment abroad, President Kennedy issued a remarkable challenge to the nation's scientific community. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The challenge of sending a man to the moon fell to NASA's scientists who quickly realized that a spaceship would need to have its own computer on board to enter and leave the lunar orbit. But how could they put a computer into a spacecraft that could barely fit three astronauts? Even transistorized computers weighed more than a ton and contained miles of wire. In addition, they had to be carefully protected from heat and vibration, hardly devices to be put aboard a spaceship. NASA scientists knew a small, lightweight computer could only be built from integrated circuits and they were willing to pay any price. So was the Pentagon. A cold war between two superpowers demanded weapons of unprecedented sophistication. By the early 1960s, computers made from integrated circuits were guiding the Minuteman II missiles. The submarine launched Polaris missiles and Air Force jets. Working around the clock to meet the needs of both NASA and the military, electronics firms discovered the true genius of the integrated circuit. Unlike the old hand-wired transistor circuits, ICs could be mass-produced. I compared it at one time to the printing press, that uh, in this case you could design it once and then reproduce it many, many times very, very inexpensively compared to, let us say, having the monks write down the book and copy it by hand, which was sort of the way we were building electronics at that time. We were taking all the elements and then putting them together. Um, with the integrated circuit, we get the chance of doing the whole thing identically, time after time.
In 1960, the first integrated circuit cost $1,000 and had fewer than 10 transistors. During the next 10 years, ICs underwent enormous change. Every year, the number of components on an integrated circuit doubled. Within a decade, the cost of an IC had dropped to pennies, while the power had increased a thousandfold. Nothing like this had ever happened in the history of any commercial product. My favorite analogy is if the auto industry had moved at the same speed as our industry, uh, your car today would uh, cruise comfortably at a million miles an hour, probably get a half a million miles per gallon of gasoline. But it would be cheaper to throw away your Rolls Royce and buy a new one than to park it downtown for the evening. As the electronics industry grew, these California peach and prune orchards were transformed into the concrete and steel of Silicon Valley. With 200 electronics firms in a 30-mile strip of land, even the streets bear witness to the growing importance of this new industry. Eight years after John Kennedy's challenge, NASA's onboard computer, built from integrated circuits, was completed. For its power, it was the smallest computer in the world. Seventy-two hours after blast-off, the tiny onboard computer would take over, guiding the Apollo 11 lunar module into the moon's orbit. The success of the mission and the lives of its astronauts depended on this small computer. It was the ultimate test of the integrated circuit's reliability. The astronauts would have to maneuver into orbit on the far side of the moon, out of contact with mission control. We'll see you on the other side, over. Roger out. Signal as Apollo 11 goes behind the moon. Everything was okay up here. It was right. Now they were on their own. Right. Their fate resting on the ability of the onboard computer to ease them into orbit. The computer performed flawlessly. With the whole world watching, Apollo 11 finally landed on the moon's surface. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Now I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This remarkable achievement was celebrated by millions of Americans, among them a generation of children who had never known a world without space travel or computers. As the 1960s came to a close, a growing group of computer enthusiasts began to dream of owning their own computers. This was the thing we had grown up to love. When I was in, in high school, I told my father that someday, back then the mini computer with 4K of RAM cost as much as a house. I told my father I've decided that someday I'm going to have an apartment instead of a house, and I'm going to buy myself a computer. I'm going to be the one person that owns a computer. Steve Wozniak and his partner Steve Jobs children of the Woodstock generation would help write the next chapter of the computer revolution, putting the power of the computer into the hands of millions of people. The J. Lyons Company only sold 100 computers in 10 years. Today, the descendants of the Leo Computer Division, like most of Britain's computer industry, is owned by Fujitsu. 
IBM is now the most profitable corporation in the world, with assets larger than many nations. Eckert and Mockley's patent for the ENIAC computer was judged invalid in 1971. Today, no one holds a patent for the invention of the computer. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. Next time on The Machine That Changed the World, two California kids lead the PC revolution. I was not designing a computer with any idea we'd ever start a company, ever have a product, ever be successful. But Apple Computer became the fastest growing company in history. Now smaller, faster and cheaper, some people loved computers. Some hated them. A paperback computer, next time on The Machine That Changed the World. This is PBS. The Dream Machine, the hardcover series companion written by John